nearly 90% of the workforce have already lost their jobs. Stiff measures to ensure survival. But for the Menem government, a cautious approach encouraging private investors to take the risks. We had a system, uh, a lot of money has been invested in the past. Uh, with the improvement of the same system, we can make a difference, we can do a lot. Uh, some people thought that uh, unless we had uh, TGVs or bullet trains, uh, we couldn't uh, be saying that uh, the railway of Argentina is coming back. Uh, we believe that uh, uh, being a poor country still, uh, we cannot afford making all these technological changes. Uh, maybe the need for very you know, sophisticated uh, futuristic trains is not here yet. Uh, so in technological terms, we probably cannot compare to countries like uh, Japan or France or others. Argentina is the victim of two failed visions. Of the developers who made its economy dependent on a foreign funded system, and the nationalists who ran the railways down. The new yardstick by which Argentina's railways will be judged is whether they can make money. The priorities of the railway today are closer now to those of the original pioneers. Some see making the railway pay as its salvation. Others argue that it represents a loss of vision of what railways are for, a means of transporting people and goods for the benefit of all. I uh, honestly believe that uh, the policy of the government as far as the railway system is concerned, it's totally illogical from all points of view. We have to understand that many, many towns in the interior of Argentina are going to be left in total isolation. And this has to do with the people, with the humble people. In Argentina, most of our people, especially, you know, the working classes, they take the trains. And uh, the main consequence of the suppression of the, of, of the railway system is that we're going to leave people in total isolation. Those are facts. The town of Maria Obanitas, once a thriving community, died with the railway. Whatever the future holds, the communities the railway built and then abandoned do not figure in the new vision. The people went to Buenos Aires, Rosario, Bergamino, and other big cities where there was work because the community couldn't do without the train. The train was very useful in the morning and the evening to get from one place to another. As soon as the train stopped, the village died. Japan's railways are the envy of the world. Fast, clean, frequent and punctual. They are a daunting example to other nations of what can be achieved when government, business and science cooperate for the benefit of all. A Shinkansen, or bullet train, leaves Tokyo Central, on average, every three and a half minutes. Welcome aboard. This train, the Nozomi Express, runs between Tokyo and Hataka. My name is Sato, 
and I will be driving this train between Tokyo and Shin Osaka via Toyohashi. I am very proud to be driving this world famous train, which is known throughout the world to be the most reliable. My son is following in my footsteps to become a train driver. He is now working for the Tobu Tetsudo line. Railways have thrived in Japan. The tightly controlled economy has protected them from competition, but at a price. In the crowded cities, trains are ideal for moving large numbers. With so many people, every part of the system has to operate like clockwork. The Japanese have invested heavily in comfortable modern trains, but with little concern about the cost. In Tokyo, trains and subways handle around 90% of the salaried workers commuting to business districts, far more than in any other city in the world. Many of the things that are most distinctive about modern Japan, both economically and culturally, are uh, epitomized by its railroad system. Economically, of course, the whole Japanese miracle could not function without this railroad network, getting people uh, from their suburbs to their jobs each day, moving freight so efficiently. Culturally, it is a kind of model of the miracle of modern Japan. Japan thrives on a culture of consensus, where the interests of the population are seen as united with those of business and commerce in a unique vision of national well-being. In Tokyo, the rail system serves about 35 million passengers every day. It is so established in Japanese popular culture that the trains will run on time that there's even a genre of detective stories where the plot always turns on train schedules and they can go do all sorts of elaborate acts of detection saying that since the 845 arrived with a minute and a half to spare for the 847 then we know the killer could have made this transition etc cetera, etc cetera. this kind of story would not be believable in the United States on the Ida line, the train departs at 10.15. She then switched to the 10.28, which arrived promptly at 10.42. She just had time to switch back to the train leaving in the other direction from Toyokawa at 10.50. She thought she could fool us by switching trains. Between the stations, it takes 15 minutes. The suspect pretended to be asleep for that time. Ah, yes. The suspect came out about 15 minutes earlier and switched trains. Japan had no wheeled transport when the first Westerners brought news of the railway in 1854. Cautious of opening its ports to Western goods, 
By the turn of the century, it was building and running its own trains. In their dash for modernization, the Japanese embraced the railway as an ideal form of transport. The geography, a narrow string of volcanic islands, and a strictly ordered society were ideal conditions for railways. As in Argentina, British engineers helped build the system. But in Japan, it remained firmly under the control of the Japanese. Ironically, the outcome of the Second World War gave the Japanese railways a further advantage. If you compare the US and Japanese or German economies since World War II, the main distortion uh, that you see in the US economy is how much of its money and especially how much of its scientific and engineering talent has gone into military-related activities. This has had some economic payoff, especially in the aviation and aerospace industries, but most people think it's been a real loss. In Japan, the same money and much of the same talent has gone instead into commercial projects and to the country's own infrastructure. And the excellence of Japan's train system is a, one sign of the things they've been able to do since they haven't been building uh, nuclear fleets. In 1964, Japan launched a futuristic new train, the Shinkansen, opened less than 20 years after the devastation of the atom bomb. It was a signal to the world. Other countries sent many to space. Japan expressed its power through the train. Well, I think what you need is what I call the building spirit. Uh, you've got to want to be a builder and set a record in history as somebody who built rather than consumed. Now, I think building is just as much a part of human nature as consuming. And of course, it's interesting if you think about it historically, the people we remember are the great builders like Ramesses II, uh, the Roman Empire, uh, the people who built and left something, not the people who had a very high standard of living. Japan certainly had the building spirit, but it came at a price. Charged with the mission of reasserting national prestige, as well as providing transport for the economic miracle, Japanese railways forged ahead with more and better new trains, but they didn't pay their way. From 1964 on, with the introduction of the bullet train, losses started and kept on accumulating. While other countries tore up tracks and pruned spending, JNR, Japan's national railways, forged ahead. Armed with what seemed to be a blank check from the government, JNR invested in state-of-the-art technology. Costs went up as the payroll increased. The government footing the bill faced a crisis. The Japanese National Railway's debt had got to be uh, such a problem that by 1987, the accumulated losses had reached 10% of the uh, gross national product of Japan at that time. That's almost 2,000 pounds per man, woman, and child in the country. In the 1980s, the vogue for questioning government spending reached Japan. Something had to be done to reduce the debt. In search of inspiration, the government looked to the private railways for help. When the Japanese National Railways were first nationalized in the early 20th century, a small number of local lines were left in private hands. And uh, these uh, grew over the years until the uh, private railways had come to rival in size the, uh, the national railways. The private railways grew with the communities they serviced. They bought up land around the tracks and developed property and service industries. They operated supermarkets and even funeral parlors. The railways were only part of their business. Today, they make money out of the customers the railways bring to their shops. In these diversified companies, the railways don't even have to make a profit. The system works. There are more private railways in Japan than anywhere else in the world. The national railways could not hope to copy the pattern of their private counterparts. Nevertheless, the government decided to privatize the system for management purposes, believing that in private hands, costs would be more firmly controlled. 